Welcome back to Beyond the Uniform. I'm Justin Nasiri, and each week I interview military veterans about their civilian career. Today is episode number 109 with John Gossert. There was a point in time, $719 in the bank. There was late night kind of us looking at each other across the table and, and talking about, you know, what what we're going to do, what we're, you know, who, how we're going to inform people that maybe they don't have jobs and how we we're going to inform, you know, kind of our larger investors that we ran out of money and you're not going to make it. Uh, and, you know, we, we turned that around in, uh, in the middle of the night with uh, one particular uh, investor that, that floated us with seed that became of strategic importance. Uh, and that was in the same year that we were acquired. Well, today's episode is a great episode for anyone considering entrepreneurship or anyone who's just really wanting to achieve the peak of their career. Um, John uh, stayed in the military for over 20 years in the Army. Uh, when he first got out through happenstance, he joined a company called Ride Scout with three other veteran uh, entrepreneurs, uh, a couple of which were on active duty at the time. Uh, Ride Scout was two years later acquired by Daimler Mercedes. Um, shortly after that, he you know, left the comfort of Daimler Mercedes and joined a second startup, his current company, which is called goodworld.me, where he's a co-founder and the chief operating officer. They have been named by Forbes magazine, uh, one of the top 25 veteran startups. They've also been named by um, uh, Fast Company, one of the most innovative companies of 2016. Um, one of the reasons why I think this is such a great listen is John's very direct in his feedback about um, entitlement in today's veterans and how to avoid that. And he's also great at describing his role in operations and in a startup and how that compares to military life and active duty life and some of the things that if you liked on active duty, you might like in startups as well. As always, at beyondtheuniform.io, you'll find show notes. I've tried to type as we go along in the interview everything here so you can see and sneak preview different parts of the interview if you want to skip around. You'll also find a free offer from audible.com, which is giving a free audiobook of your choice to Beyond the Uniform listeners at beyondtheuniform.io slash books. So with that, let's dive in to my interview with John Gossert. Joining me today in Alexandria, Virginia, is John Gossert. John, welcome to Beyond the Uniform. Hey, thanks for having me, Justin. So for listeners, I want to give uh, John's background. I'm going to go into a little bit more detail than I normally do, just because I think John has a different background than I usually have on the show. So John is the co-founder and the chief operating officer of a company called Good World. It is a financial technology or fintech startup that's revolutionizing philanthropy and social payments. They were actually named one of Fast Company's most innovative companies of 2016 and also DC's best technology startup. Uh, prior to Good World, John was an original partner at Ride Scout, uh, ridescout.com, which is a tech startup that was acquired by Daimler Mercedes back in 2014. Before becoming an entrepreneur, John served over 22 years in the U.S. Army and in the government, uh, work that took him to various locations across, across Africa, Pakistan, Yemen, Afghanistan, Iraq, and Europe, most recently serving as a Deputy Director of Special Operations and Counterterrorism Policy in the Office of the Secretary of Defense. He graduated from Boston College, has a Master's in Public Policy and Fiscal Management from the McCourt School of Public Policy at Georgetown University, where he continues to teach policy and economics as an adjunct professor. And then on a personal note, John is uh, part of an indie rock band, Stone Driver, which recently released their first studio album called Rocks. And in between Good World teaching and shows, he lives a quiet life in Old Town, Alexandria, Virginia, with his wife, Lisa, and their four sons. Um, so, uh, John, maybe to start things off, um, how would you explain Good World? Uh, I guess the, the most simple way to ex explain Good World is we're trying to solve the problem of frictionless payment experience. And we're going to market in the charitable giving uh, vector or, or vertical first. And quite simply, we're allowing people to make payments, in this case, donations to causes that they're passionate about with just a hashtag or a tweet. So 
Uh, we've got 3,000 charity partners from the largest in the world, like uh, Save the Children and UNICEF and the Red Cross and Greenpeace and PETA, to a bunch of, uh, of smaller ones, thousands of smaller ones you, you may have never heard of. But uh, when they make a post or, or on social media, on Facebook, or, or tweet out, uh, you can tweet back at them, hashtag donate, or hashtag donate in a number, or you can just make a comment on a Facebook post, and the, my technology kicks in, and uh, it automatically processes uh, that donation uh, through a credit card transaction or an ACH, drops that money straight into the coffers of the charity, and then you get a response on social media for all your friends and, uh, and family network to see uh, they're on social media. So it's a, it's a truly like social and shared uh, experience. So that's of course all our technology at work that's uh, that's making all those things happen automatically. So we are working with charity you know, right now, but we're in a, involved in a lot of strategic conversations with large corporates about how this would apply in all the places that you think it would apply, like uh, donations to colleges and universities, political donations, and commerce. Uh, and we're talking to some of the biggest companies in the world about uh, how our technology you know could could work in banking and commerce. This is awesome. Well, I, I want to back up because I want to learn more about your journey here. And I, I'm in particularly interested because a lot of the people I have on the show, you know, they get out after five years or seven years and they kind of build up their career. And and I'd love to hear, um, you know, you you served for over 20 years uh, in the military and in the government. And I'm, I'm curious, when you made that first transition to civilian life, what was that first job search like? Where did you go initially? Yeah, I'm not going to be of, of any help to people that are looking for either uh, inspiration or advice on how to successfully transition because it was happenstance for me. I was in Yemen the first time that the guys who would start Ride Scout, uh, three guys that, that I had taught with at West Point mid-career. I didn't go to West Point, but I taught there. Uh, I went to Boston College. But um, they reached out to me because they had this idea for uh, a transportation tech startup, uh, for a consumer-facing application, and they were looking for you know like a guy to help with revenue and numbers and finance. And, and uh, you know, they reached out to me, and I... You know, I was living in a different world. I, I thought I was doing the Lord's work out there, and, and we were the most important people in the world. And I think the first time they reached out to me, I didn't even answer. Uh, I didn't know what an app was. I didn't know anything about entrepreneurship in general. Uh, I, I certainly didn't know anything about the tech and startup world. In fact, they were, they were talking about SXSW. I didn't even know what that acronym was uh, back at that time. They were, of course, talking about launching at South by Southwest. So... I ignored it the first time around. And then a few months later, I was in Pakistan. They came at me again after they had, had gone to South by uh, and, and kind of unveiled the concept. They didn't quite have an MVV product out yet. And some things were going on in my life. And I, I just came to realize that I hadn't been home in the better part of a decade. My sons were getting older. I have four adult sons now. But at this time, they were in high school and college. And uh, I just you know, I, could I be away from home any longer uh, than I already am? And so I I thought, you know, maybe I should think about doing something else. And so I kind of made a very hasty decision um, and, and I decided to do something different. I was also tired. I was really tired. So I, I came back and very quickly kind of started taking steps to, to, to get out. I figured I'd work with these guys for, you know, six months. Most of these things fail, uh, you know, startups. Uh, and I, but I figured that would give me time and space to figure out what I was going to do in the next uh, chapter of my life. And, and really two things happened that set me on the path I'm on right now. Number one, I found that, that the adrenaline rush that I was so afraid I was going to miss uh, is abounds in the startup world. Uh, you know, it's very scrappy and you're always worried about running out of money and are you going to live to fight another day in a figurative sense, right? Nobody's actually shooting at you. But um, it did give me some of the fulfillment that I was worried about losing, uh, leaving, leaving service. And then the other thing uh, is we didn't fail. In fact, you know, two years later, we were acquired by Domino Mercedes. And, and both financially and personally and professionally, uh, it was a life-changing experience. And so, um, yeah, I, you know, I never looked back. But, you know, it wasn't my ACAP experience or whatever they call it now. I think they call it something different. It, it, it wasn't – I don't have a lot of anecdotal – uh, anecdotes to share about my, my job search. I literally like stepped out of one thing into another thing where I wasn't getting paid uh, and, and we made a go of it and we were very fortunate in, uh, that we made it successful so, and lucky. So, and, and one thing I was curious about is coming directly from 
um, a career of service in the military into that startup environment, what were what were some of the skills that you were lacking that you had to, to really work to build up? And then what were some of the things that you took from the military that really helped you in that first role at Ride Scout? It's interesting. Um, I didn't know this at the time, but I've come to learn it in the last five, six years since I've been out um, or however long it's been, four or five years. There are, there are certainly attributes and skills uh, and perspective that you pick up in military service that are, that are unique uh, to military service and that are helpful uh, when you come out in, into either just the commercial world in general or the business world or, or specifically the startup world and the tech startup world. Um, but there are as many, if not more, things that you need to leave behind. They, these are things that maybe served you well in a military environment or a more hierarchical kind of government service environment, but they won't serve you well out here. And I'll just give you like a quick example. Uh, at the very beginning, I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, you know, me and this guy, Steve Carroll, who was one of the four of us that, that started Ride Scout, uh, he used to come over to my house at 6.30 in the morning. Uh, kind of Ride Scout headquarters at that time was my dining room table. Uh, Joseph Kopser, who's the founder and CEO, was still technically like the PMS at uh, University of Texas. So he would come over at 6.30 in the morning and we'd open up our you know, personal laptops and you know, crack knuckles and be like, okay, start up. You know? But I didn't know what to do. Like, am I supposed to email somebody? Am I supposed to, you know, like, I, I didn't know what I was supposed to do. And, and now we did have a plan and the idea that Joseph had was huge. Um, and inspiring, but as far as like what we were supposed to do, I, me personally, I won't speak on behalf of the other guys, um, but I was in you know a little bit over my head, and so as we were starting to to try to make our contacts and start working kind of the business development side of this, I found myself very frustrated that people wouldn't respond to my emails within 24 hours. It seems to me like that's professional courtesy, and that's the way that I grew up. Um, but the world doesn't really work like that, and somebody will answer an email three weeks later like they just got it. And be like, hey, great to hear from you, thanks, you know, let's meet, or something. Um, so some of the hierarchy and some of the protocols that are just second nature to you as a soldier or as a member of the military or the government, you got to leave some of those behind because they don't work very well in very flat, dynamic, creative organizations in the tech startup world. Working with engineers in and of itself is uh, is a very unique experience, and it takes a lot of skill as a leader to corral those guys and, and direct them and collaborate with them. Uh, and, and the hierarchical knife hand direction is not going to work uh, in that environment. So you got to know what to take with you and what to leave behind. I think some of the things that y- you take with you that are very helpful is kind of respect, having respect, uh, you know, for everybody that's on the other side of the table. Uh, in, in your dealings uh, with them, or at least giving them the benefit of the doubt and offering that respect up front. Uh, I think our checklist mentality, uh, while my guys make fun of me uh, in, my, in my startup, it's very helpful to us. When we're all like, you know, tired and crashing on something, it's good to have you know, the equivalent of an ops sked to know these are the things that we've got to get done before we, we go live with this new product line or this new feature. Uh, or before we're going to support this event. So those are the types of things that, um, you know, that I took with me. Preparation, the, the, the premium that we place uh, as soldiers on preparation uh, phase before you go into execution phase, because we all can execute, right? But, uh, yeah, those are the things that jump out at me. But I think there's many more that, that you do. you got to leave behind painfully. I, I really appreciate that. I think that's such a succinct and spot-on um definition of the 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 i love the way that you put it where there's so many things that help you from the military but there's just as many if not more that you need to leave behind and i still i mean god i'm like 10 years out now and i still have this th- that compulsive email tendency where i expect responses and i expect that courtesy and i'm like always responding right away and it's just funny because it's like i think that comes from the military but that's definitely doesn't really it doesn't really serve me well in, in the civilian workforce um be careful. it always makes me think of that uh, uh seinfeld episode where george doesn't know whether you should call the woman back that he went on the date <laughs> with. and and then she she won't respond he ends up leaving this whole trail of of psycho voicemail messages for her but it just turns out she was like away for the weekend i've come very close to doing the business equivalent of that and you know blasting somebody for being not responsive to me when in fact you know i just needed to learn 
you know, the culture and the environment that I was in before I started shooting people. And, yeah. and thankfully, I didn't, I didn't blow any big deals for my own ignorance in that regard. Yeah, I, I agree. It, was, there, was there a distinct turning point for you at Ride Scout? Like, you, you know, you talked about the four of you guys around your dining room table. And then, you know, obviously two years later, um, Daimler comes in and, and buys you. Was there a point where it went from this is a cool idea that we're excited about to like, the, and you'd said you started with this thought of just being there for six months. Was there a point you remember where it just took off and things changed from startup to like, this is actually a company? You know, I think it's hard. I mean, for me, for a couple of reasons. Number one, Joseph Kotzer is the guy that came up with the idea. And in his mind, it was always this world changing big idea. He's also, his personality is also very consistent with that. So I think the reason that the four of us fit very well is we were coming from four different cardinal directions in our role in the business, our kind of philosophy uh, in, in how we execute and how we do things. Joseph was the evangelist. He was the guy, he was the face of the company. It was his idea. He was the vision guy. Uh, and he was larger than life, whether he was like on a stage pitching for money or a pitch competition, or whether he was just talking to the guy in the elevator about what he does. Uh, and then me, I was on the total other end of the spectrum. I was you know, sharpening the pencil and rolling up my sleeves and trying to figure out how we can create a sustainable revenue stream in what back then was a consumer facing application. So I, I think I had my head down a lot uh, and I could have had my head up more. And then, you know, Joseph had his head up all the time. And sometimes, you know, I'd have to fight to make him put his head down for a minute so we could talk about the things that I thought were important right this second. But at the end of the day, when, when it happened and it happened very quickly, we were raising, uh, a series A. So we were, you know, talking to some entities uh, about term sheets and, and seeing the best deal we could get for our next round of financing. We raised a couple million dollars on convertible debt, a lot of it being friends and family and, uh, and angels in small increments. But we were trying to raise this institutional round. And, you know, when Daimler came in and we, we had had a, a little bit of a relationship already with them through car to go which is a company they owned. But when Daimler came in, initially we assumed that they were joining this conversation about it being a potential lead for the Series A team term sheet that we were looking for, when in fact they were looking to acquire us from the outset uh, when those conversations started. So in that regard, it, it, it kind of happened very quickly. But at that point, it was a real company. I mean, I think we probably had, you know, between including part-time employees, there was probably like 15 or 16 of us uh, at, the, at the time that, you know, Daimler came in and we started going into diligence about acquisition. Uh, and then very quickly after that, it went up to, I don't know, 50 plus employees in the, in the post acquisition phase and, and it got reflagged to Austin, Texas. But, you know, I, I think it, it was kind of like boiling a frog. It was, you know, me and Steve at our dining room table and Joseph still on active duty, you know, and, and Craig, uh, kind of the chairman, but doing a lot of, a lot of different things, uh, in and out of ride scout to us sitting, uh, you know, having weekly meetings with 15 people and talking about usage statistics and things like that. And then, you know, going through diligence with German lawyers and being acquired by Daimler uh, and having a big headquarters on 6th Street in Austin, you know, with 50 people. Uh, it, it didn't happen quickly, but there was no one point. I mean, there were certainly like some setbacks and some, some victories uh, that we had in a tactical level that I remember, but no one of those things uh, turned us. The one thing that turned us was Daimler bought us. Um, and that, uh, you know, that helped us personally, professionally, and it helped take the company vision to the next level. It's now called Moveville North America, uh, a subsidiary of Daimler. What, you know, after that acquisition, how, how long did you stay at Daimler? And, and I'm also curious, kind of like the origin story of Good World, like how, how you went from Ride Scout post acquisition to, to starting this next company. We launched Ride Scout out of an incubator called 1776 in Washington, D.C., uh, and we were one of the first tenants uh, in here uh, in Washington. And uh, in the course of us launching the company out of here and, um, uh, and working here you know, day in, day out and growing our team here at 1776, I came to know, you know other entrepreneurs in the building, in the, in the incubator. And one of those is Dale Pfeiffer, who's 
uh, you know, kind of the other half uh, of Good World. In fact, it was, it was her idea. She's the founder and CEO of Good World. And she had this great idea, and she had an intern, and she had her laptop, um, and she had an engineer collaborator uh, that was working on, uh, you know, an MVP, but she didn't have any corporate structure around it. There was no financial instrument. And so I was kind of advising her on, you know, kind of taking it to, to the next step. Uh, and some of the corporate, I, I wear the COO and CFO hats uh, at Good World. So I, as the more I came to know Dale and I was just kind of advising her on the side, the more I learned about the idea and the more it got me thinking about the, the possibilities in the payments and, and fintech space in general. Plus, it was so cool to go to market and, and kind of philanthropy, uh, you know, as somebody, you know, Jesuit educated and, uh, you know, I, I always thought that that the philanthropy was something that I would have to do kind of on the side as a volunteer or maybe later in life when I had enough money that I could, you know, make a more substantive, you know, contribution to causes I care about. But this was an opportunity to, you know, for your day job to also be, you know, helping, you know, causes that you're passionate about at the same time. So it was on my mind. I, I caught myself kind of thinking about it at night uh, and, and coming up with ideas and, and collaborating with Dale on those as we were going through the diligence process to be acquired by Daimler. By the time we were acquired at the end of 14 and the beginning of 15, you know, rolls around, you know, I'm, I'm neck deep in post acquisition Daimler. It's busy. We're, we're doing a lot. Uh, now we've got a big budget and we need to get going with it. But at the same time, uh, you know, I'm kind of helping Dale on the side. And in the course of those conversations, I helped her raise the first little bit of money. And that for me is when the light really went off because we raised $500,000 in days. Uh, and it, it just really struck me that people, it, it really resonated with sophisticated investors. And so we didn't even do convertible debt. We, uh, we switched it to a price round and, uh, you know, we ended up raising about 1.6 uh, in, uh, in our first seed round with institutional finance partners as leads. Uh, and while, while that was unfolding, it just became clear to me that if I was gonna do this, I needed to, to commit to it. And so I started thinking about how, how could I, without being really stupid and leaving lots of money and equity on the table, how could I reconcile this? And at the end of the day, it was clear, like I couldn't do both. So I negotiated kind of a deal with, um, with Ride Scout, well, with Moveable North America, about how I could phase myself out, uh, but still kind of retain the big parts uh, of my deal and my equity, but also, you know, not, you know, I had an ethical responsibility. If I was going to be a Ride Scout executive, I need to be a Ride Scout executive. If I was going to be a Good World executive, I need to be a Good World executive. So yeah, I had to take my hand off that other thing. And, and that, I think, is, 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 I don't have much advice to give, but that's one thing. If you're going to commit to something, commit to it. Uh, because if I kept my hand on both those things, I was getting paid a lot of money by down there. It was, like, was going to be a nice life post-acquisition, but I would have been a, a, a you know, kind of a subpar uh, Daimler executive, and I would have been a kind of subpar co-founder uh, of a new fintech startup. Um, and, you know, I had, to, I had to choose. So it just became clear to me that this idea was too big to pass up. And even though, you know, financially, it wasn't in my best interest in the short term, uh, that pa my passion was, was with Good World. So I went in that direction. My wife was very supportive of that, and we hope to, you know, pay ourselves someday, you know, on this on this big idea. But I haven't regretted it for a minute. When you started um, Ride Scout, all four of you were veterans. Is that right? Yeah. So Joseph came up with the idea. Craig put in some of the beginning capital. Uh, uh, Craig Cummings. Uh, Craig was already out, and had been out, and it was actually kind of a second time entrepreneur uh, in Ride Scout. He had started a very cool uh, uh, company already um, that, that had had a successful exit. Um, Joseph you know, has, has the big idea and was kind of working on the engineering side of it with some people in, in Texas while he was still on active duty. Steve Carroll was just getting out, you know, hitting his, I think he'd ended up doing 22 too. He was prior service and he was here in the DC area and then I was the last guy to kind of join the core team. Um, and, and I got out. And in fact, I, like during my, my transition period overlap, and I was working basically, you know, I spent all my time working for, 
uh, for Ride Scout. So yes, everybody was a veteran, but at the time that, that Joseph came up with the idea and really started building the company, uh, he wasn't quite yet a veteran. He was still on active duty. One one thing I was curious about in your situation is, you know, having worked first with um, Ride Scout with with a group of veterans as co-founders, and then with Dale as a as a civilian co-founder. What advice do you have for veterans if they're thinking about finding a co-founder? Do you have thoughts on, you know, because I, I have always approached this where it's like, man, I, me as a veteran, I have so little business experience. I need to offset that with someone who's not a veteran. And I'm just curious if you have thoughts and looking for a co-founder, how to find that person and vet them and make sure they're right, but also whether or not it's better to have a civilian or, or another veteran as a co-founder. There are two things, if you're starting your own thing, there's two things that, that are very easy to give but are very hard to take away, and that's titles and equity. So, uh, you know, if you're going to make somebody the co-founder, uh, and, you know, not to go too much in the weeds, but when you, you, know, when you start a company and you incorporate it and uh, there's this one-time, you know, IRS lets you one-time convey what's called founder shares, um, and you get to pay par value for those. And so it, it's very, you know, it, those are the best possible types of shares to have. Um, you can only do that once. You should not enter into calling someone your co-founder, really calling someone anything that starts with a C uh, or C-suite nah, or probably anything that starts with a C, right? But you definitely want to be very careful about those things. If, you, if, you, if you're lacking business kind of institutional expertise, you can bring in a business person and give them an options package that if they don't stay, doesn't vest and, you know, and then you're not, you know, creating uh, somebody that's going to be with you the rest of your life, whether they're going to continue to be with the company or not. Um, so there's this, I think, misconception sometimes that people have is like, I got to find an engineer and make him my co-founder and CTO. No, maybe you just need to find an engineer to work with. And maybe you will find after six months or a year or however long that that person will actually be a great co-founder and CTO and you can make them that uh, or her that. Um, but same thing, you know, with business or civilian or whatever, I think you, you don't want to rush into, you know, marriage until you're sure that, that you want to get married to, to this person. And so co-founders, uh, C-suite uh, titles, people with significant equity stakes, and your idea, those are all, I think they should be very deliberative decisions and there should be some trial period. So you're not, you know, hiring lawyers now to try to get you out of this decision that you made very quickly. Um, I didn't have uh, like real practical business experience. Uh, I've been in the government my entire life, in the military and the government my entire life. But a lot of business is about executing. Uh, a lot of business is, is about leadership and and knowing when you don't know something to either go research that thing and become expert in it. You know, we got, the, we got a whole internet that, that can help us, you know, figure out what, you know, convertible debt versus, you know, priced equity is. Um, you can figure out how to code is a little bit harder, but you can be a, a good leader and smart enough to know how to hire some talent or to offer some talent, some options or something to, to help you build this thing. Um, and so I think those decisions you should enter into very, very carefully. And it doesn't necessarily mean you need a civilian or an engineer that's co-founder. You need maybe a civilian or engineer to help you. And then you might grow into those roles. And then maybe not. More often than not, they, you know, they don't. I love that. I love that. I, I, I want to ask you a couple other questions about just startups in general, but I, I wanted to give listeners context. So I, I actually found John, I was looking at an article called, by in Forbes magazine called the top 25 veteran founded startups in America. So, you know, right from the get go, this is, you know, a pretty incredible group to be a part of. And, you know, that's talking about John's current startup. Good world. It wasn't even including his previous incredible success with Ride Scout, and so I just want to set the stage that you know John has. Um, and and, and I, another thing, I'm, I'm just owning my own bias. I usually associate this incorrectly with the man or woman who got out right at five years and dove into this and was young and hungry and had all of this time to to achieve this. And so, you know, given what John's achieved, and he did it after tw over 20 years of service, I, I think it's, it can't be overstated how much John has accomplished 
within the tech world and within the startup world. And, and John, you and I were chatting just before we started recording, and I wanted to start by just asking, you know, as veterans are thinking, you know, maybe someone listening is, is thinking of getting out of the military and thinking of starting a company, um, what advice would you give to them and what misconceptions might they have about startups? Yeah, I think it's it, and conventional or, or, I don't know, an adage is, you know, don't, don't read your own press or don't buy into your own, don't believe your own press. Um, but I think that is more true for transitioning veterans today than, than ever before. The stuff that you were just talking about, I'm, you know, I think it looks good on paper and, and I like to consider myself accomplished, but you know, there's a lot of people around me, like as we speak right now, as I look left and right, that I would consider more, more accomplished than me. So I, I try not to believe my own press and, and fast company and Forbes. Um, but for veterans that are transitioning now, we are in such a divisive political climate in this country and veterans and the military are being tossed right in the middle of this uh, kind of political uh, firestorm that's going on. And the, the narrative that, that both sides want to cling to because it's very popular with, with people is, is that big narrative about how much we owe to veterans for their service. And I don't disagree with that big narrative. Absolutely. Listen, I'm very thankful for all the veterans out there. Or I'm sorry, for all the, the people in uniform uh, today that are out there that are helping, you know, to protect me and, and my way of life and allow me to do what I do every day out of uniform. And all the veterans that, that were once those people. And I'm very thankful for that. Nobody's arguing that big narrative. But I think that that's got conflated with this other narrative that says that veterans are owed all these other things. I mean, they're, they're owed everything from like financial, uh, you know, like funding for their, their startup. Well, what if their startup's not a good idea? What if they can't scale? What if the, the veteran's not a good entrepreneur? You shouldn't invest in that. I mean, from a business perspective. So just because he's a veteran and, and he's got all these great attributes and he served honorably, that doesn't mean you should invest in his or her company because maybe they're not very good at that. Um, but I worry that we're, we're building our soldiers and, and military service members up with a bit of a sense of entitlement, believe it or not, that there's this expectation that when they step out in the civilian world that, you know, that they're owed something. And, you know, for me, the army and me are 100% square the day I left. In fact, I would argue I got more out of the army than, than they got out of me. I, you know, I got paid a competitive wage. It's a volunteer army. They paid for uh, my tuition at Boston College, which I and my family couldn't afford. They sent me around the world. They gave me leadership experience that I don't think I could have gotten in any other institution where the stakes were about as high as they could possibly be. Uh, you know, the resume that I have was built mostly by the United States Army. I'm very thankful. They sent me to grad school. They sent me to Georgetown, you know, where I teach now on the side. I, I have not one complaint about the ledger between me and the Army. So when I walk out, and oh, by the way, I'm still getting paid, you know, a pension and some disability. So to walk out and expect that, you know, I'm entitled to funding for my startup because I'm a veteran, I mean, I think that's a dangerous mentality to have. I don't want to be entitled to funding for my startup because I'm a veteran. I want to be entitled to funding for my startup because it's a good idea and that, you know, sophisticated institutional investors see it as a sound investment and that they want to, you know, they want to make money and they think that I'm the guy that can execute that. Now, if it comes down to, you know, me and the other, the guy next to me, there might be some of those attributes uh, that I have that are part and parcel of being a veteran that give me an edge over the guy on my left or right. And I'm all about that. But I don't want to start the conversation with, I'm a veteran. I want to start the con today, I start the conversation with, I'm an entrepreneur. You know, I'm a co-founder and, and COO of, uh, you know, a pretty amazing fintech company. Uh, and oh, by the way, I, I'm a veteran. But I just get the sense that there's a lot of people out there, you know, especially people without military service, that think everybody's, you know, a hero and everybody's entitled to, you know, a lot of things that, you know, they may or may not be entitled to be. And sometimes that's controversial opinion to have but you know i've been out for a while uh and i and i do see people that are kind of treading water uh as they're trying to start new things because they're looking for all these vet channels to give them a step up the best way 
to get a step up is the fundamentals. If you've got a real solution to a real scalable problem, uh, you know, and, and a good idea and a good product uh, behind that, and you put a good team around you, then chances are you're going to, you know, be successful. And, and that veteran piece might help you on the margin uh, in some tough situations. There's certainly a great work ethic and some other things that go with it. But if you don't have those fundamentals, it doesn't matter how honorable your service was, how many times you got shot at or blown up, um, that, that's not going to help you out here in, in this world in and of itself. I, I appreciate that, and I, I love that perspective. And I think that ev- even if someone listening is disagreeing with, with what you're saying, it's like if you take that mindset, I think it's – that it's going to benefit someone. If you exit the military with the mindset of, I'm going to have to earn everything that I get, I'm going to have to work for everything that I want, I don't see a way in which that hurts someone on active duty or a veteran. I think that's only an asset. And I know from, I mean, this is the 109th interview I've done. I know so many of the people I've interviewed, they did leave service thinking like, oh, I'm, I'm great, which they are, and I'm, I'm very high capable, which they are, but they, they left with a sense of entitlement that led to disappointment, that led to putting in less effort, that led to being frustrated where they didn't get 10 job offers the day they left the military, or they didn't get 10 offers from funding the first time they pitched because they expected things to be easier than they actually are. And, and I think one thing exactly. that comes through in your story is that you, you know, you have had to fight for the things that you've gotten. And, and although, you know, although Better World has gotten funding relatively quickly, it's not like you sat down, you had a conversation, you guys got term sheets. Like you guys, I'm sure were working hard. You were burning the midnight oil. You were helping her, giving it ideas. You were really um, refining this idea and that led to good things, but none of it was handed to you. And I, I agree. Joseph that, yeah. always cringes yep. when I tell, uh, when, I, when I drop this detail, um, you know, when we were on the victory lot tour, but there was a point in time, $719 in the bank. There was late night kind of us looking at each other across the table and, and talking about, you know, what, what we're going to do, what we're, you know, who, how we're going to inform people that maybe they don't have jobs and how we're going to inform, you know, kind of our larger investors that we ran out of money and you're not going to make it. Uh, and, you know, we, we turned that around in, uh, in the middle of the night with uh, one particular uh, investor that, that floated us with seed that became of strategic importance. Uh, and that was in the same year that we were acquired. So we were very, we were very close to an existential threat to our existence uh, in, in Ride Scout. So, I mean, I think what you're saying is 100 percent true. Uh, we. We did have to work uh, very hard. We were fortunate that uh, you know that we had the right the right team and the right work ethic and everything. But that didn't stop us from seven hundred nineteen dollars in the bank and having to explain to investors why you know kind of one and a half million dollars we went you know, we went through it and we couldn't make it go. Um, and and you got to be prepared for that. I mean, a lot of these ventures because of timing and, and other reasons, you know, they're they're not going to make it. And it's not because the world is stacked against vets. I mean, the, the market actually, especially of late, is, is pretty efficient. And, and you got to listen to it. I agree with everything that you're saying about uh, the sense of entitlement. And it's not just about people that are starting new things. You know, you get these people that come out of the military, and I was probably guilty of some of this myself. And, and you go to work for like a normal company, and, you know, you turn to your boss at, at 10 o'clock in the morning and say, hey, boss, just so you know, I got a dentist appointment today. So, you know, this afternoon I'm going to be, and that boss is going to be like, oh, okay, that's not my problem. You need to be at work. And you're like, well, what do you mean? You have to let me go to dentist. No, he, he doesn't. But that's something that we learned in the military, right? Uh, you got to let me go, uh, first sergeant, because I got a dentist appointment, no matter when that appointment is. Uh, so there are those, those things that you got to drop. You got to check at the door when you, when you leave and, and not lead with, Somebody owes you something as a veteran, and really anything. I mean, there are other you know people that walk through life thinking they're owed something for other reasons. But uh, but for being a veteran, you know, you were given a lot of what you were owed. You know, a competitive paycheck and experience and benefits and and all that stuff. And and lately, it seems politically like the thanks of a grateful nation, uh, which wasn't always the case. Like when my dad was coming back from Southeast Asia. 
So I think veterans are, are, are treated pretty well, but at the end of the day, it's going to come down to fundamentals, right? If, if you want to lose weight, you need to eat less, exercise more, do a combination uh, thereof. Being a veteran ain't going to help that. I love it. I love all this. Um, for someone listening um, who might want to pursue startups, could you talk a little bit more about your role as chief operations officer? You said you also play that role of chief financial officer. What does your day-to-day and week-to-week life look like in a startup in that capacity? Yeah, it's. I think one of the reasons that I that I got the bug when I started doing the entrepreneur thing, you know, first at Ride Scout and then now at Good World, is because. It reminded me a lot of kind of the, the, my scrappy days as, you know, chief of staff uh, at Brigade or, you know, executive officer or an operations officer. You never knew what you never had the same day twice, uh, you know, in, in a lot of cases. And, and I like that. You know, you're you're kind of moving from sometimes crisis to crisis or, you know, having to execute things very quickly, a lot of times under resourced um, problem solving. It's got to happen quick. There are consequences. And, and I loved living in that environment in the military. And when I was in environments in, in some jobs in the military, we all have them that, were, that weren't as high paced as that. I very quickly, uh, you know, sought that next thing because it just, it wasn't, it wasn't fulfilling. I, I need that. And the COO role in a startup, especially, you know, in a smaller startup uh, is you, you never know what the day is going to bring. Uh, there's going to be two or three things that you're going to deal with that you didn't plan to deal with when the day started. Um, you got to make sure your people get paid. You got to make sure that you know your insurance is up to date. You got to you know deal with uh, HR uh, issues. You're going to have to call people in and fire them. You're going to have to you know search for for people to hire. Uh, you're looking at. I model out you know every week at the beginning of the week. I model out our spending and call it the burn. Uh, to see exactly to the day when the end of our ramp is. I want that, that date to be burned into the minds of everyone in the organization. We have enough money to live until this day. And how do we change that? Well, you know, we, we increase our revenue or we get these partnerships locked in or we secure you know, institutional financing that's going to increase that. So I don't have like a, a normal day. You know, I might find myself in San Francisco or New York. I spend a lot of time asking people for money. I spend a lot of times, you know, negotiating with executives of, you know, strategic partners that we're trying to bring on. Um, and I spend a lot of time looking inward. I probably spend half my time looking inward inside the organization and making sure that the, you know, the trains are running on time. So uh, probably not the, the answer you're looking for. I don't have uh, a, a routine day. And when the days start to get routine, an organization that's usually when I start to get restless that's such a great description I, I always thought that veterans are well suited for these operational roles and I love that um, how you compare that to your time on active duty and the things that you enjoyed there the unpredictability and the problem solving and just kind of moving on the fly and planning and, and just every day is a new challenge I think that if someone is listening and that's the part they love about the military early stage startups or a COO role or a role in operations is probably a good fit and there's probably a good number of, of people in the armed services who hear that and that's like they're the least favorite part of being in the military. It's a good sign that, that startups might not be a good fit or maybe operations isn't your ideal type of role. So I think that's a, a really helpful perspective. Um, is there any resource, and by that I mean a book, a course, a webinar, a podcast. Is there any resource that's really been helpful to you in your civilian career that you would recommend to veterans listening? I just got asked this question in, uh, in another uh, kind of veteran uh, circle uh, podcaster show, and I, I, I don't have a great answer. I, I probably should. I was never good at, uh, at reading you know, the seminal biography of this military leader, uh, you know, the professional development reading list that was always floating around and, and following me around in, in my career that it seemed like all the fast burners were reading. Um, I, was not, I was not always drawn uh, to, to those things. Similarly, when I, you come out here in the startup world, there's always like the next like hot book that someone has written uh, in the entrepreneurial world or the tech startup space that, you know, everybody seems to have be carrying around with them and they're buzzing and chatting and talking about it. Again, I, I've just never been very good at uh, or really wanted to, to chase those down, even though I, I assume that there's probably a lot of great resources in those. 
But having said that, the best resource recommendation I have, it is about reading, uh, but it's more just about preparation in general and words in general. You shouldn't take a meeting without reading everything that you can about the person that's going to be on the other side of the table or on the phone. You shouldn't, you know, if, if, the, if the meeting is teed up and we're going to talk about, uh, you know, I don't know, the equity or a cap table and you don't understand what a cap table is and how it converts, then you need to, you know, there's a whole internet out there uh, and many resources, but you need to prepare and make yourself expert so that you can, you know, have the leverage that you need to have so that you can bring credibility and legitimacy into the discussion so that you're not dismissed, so that you're not, you know, taking a bad deal uh, away for yourself or your company because, you know, it becomes apparent that you don't understand uh, the subject matter at hand. So I spend a great deal of my time reading to educate myself, to make sure that I understand everything uh, that we're going to talk about in this, you know, this phone call or this meeting or this contract negotiation uh, or, you know, even as I'm, I'm drawing up you near know, plans, I'm trying to read about, uh, you know, I'm trying to find examples. And so I'm always out there educating myself, especially on, on the finance side, because there's so much uh, that, in, that is entailed in that uh, and kind of running the finance side. Uh, of your company. So I don't have like a magic book, but I spend a great deal of my time reading and, and preparing. So I I'd say words are an, an important research and uh, an important resource and people need to, uh, they need to, you need to prepare for every interaction that you're going to have. So the other it. guy, if the other guy is, then he's going to beat you. I love it. It's like that tactics preparation and, and getting ready for, for battle. Um, I always like to end with an open-ended question, which is you have given so much incredible advice. I know it's been helpful to me, and I know our, our listeners will benefit as well. But um, I'm just curious, any final words of wisdom, anything we haven't covered that you'd want active duty and recently transitioned veterans to know? You know, I don't know we talked about it, I guess, a little bit before when I was talking about kind of the end of Ride Scout or the post acquisition period of Ride Scout and, and, and when Good World came up. I felt, you know, very conflicted and I was trying to, you know, I was trying to hang on. You know, the the adage of course if you defend everything, you defend nothing. I mean I think there's there's some truth to that. You you need to commit to what you're doing. And I see a lot of people that fancy themselves to be, you know, vetrepreneurs, I think is a word that people throw around and and they're scrappy and they've got big ideas but they don't want to take their hand off that, you know, comfortable thing, which tends to be the job that they have and the paycheck that they can count on. But the problem is there's an opportunity cost for, you know, eight hours a day doing something else. Uh, and it's going to make you less likely to succeed, you know, in, in your idea. If, if, if everybody could start something huge and, you know, and change their life just on the side and then not leave your job until you had this like safety net to jump into, uh, of your big new company, well then everybody would do that. So you need to think about like you know what is what is my priority? Where do I want to be? And if if you if you where you want to be is, is starting something new, then you need to commit to that. And and, and if you're the way that you can tell if you've committed enough, uh, there should be risk. Uh, there should be people in your circle that are like you're crazy, uh, you know for for taking that chance or or jumping off that cliff. And you should be a little bit anxious and sometimes even scared. Uh, those are all good indicators that, that you're committing en enough to potentially be successful. But if it's a very comfortable kind of foray into your next thing, then chances are you haven't, you know, you haven't committed enough. I had to come home, you know, from my government job and, and tell my wife that I wanted, you know, I wanted to, to jump into this new thing that wasn't really going to pay us. And we had kids in private high school and, and college. Uh, and, and that's when I wanted to choose to leave stable uh, job in government service and, and you know, and, and join this team of, of guys that are trying to start something new. Uh, there was some risk and, and some angst uh, in, that, uh, in that. But in order to do it right, I mean, we all, the four of us, we had to commit. Uh, and I think we did. So if you're going to do something right, you got to commit. You got you to gotta jump. Uh, and knowing that there's no guarantee, veteran or not, that you're going to succeed. But you'll have a better chance uh, if you commit fully. Uh, to, to what you're what you're trying to do. 
Well, John, this has been um, awesome. I, I really appreciate your advice and help. And for listeners, you'll find more information at beyondtheuniform.io in the show notes. Uh, you can find John at goodworld.me. You can also learn more about his rock band Stone Driver at stonedriver.com. And yeah, thanks, John, for the example you are to the veteran community and also for all the advice that you've shared today. Yeah, thanks for doing this. I think this is a great resource. Um, present company excluded, you've had some uh, great people. Um, <laughs> but I, I look forward to digging through some of the archives and listening to, uh, to some advice that I probably surely need from the prior guests. Service, service, service. All right, gang, thanks for listening to today's interview with John Gossert. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you have feedback, drop me a note at justin at beyondtheuniform.io. If you know of veterans who would benefit from this, please pass this along to them. If you have the time, take a few minutes, give us a positive review on iTunes. That tends to get the word out about Beyond the Uniform. You can sign up for our newsletter at beyondtheuniform.io. You can follow us on Facebook, both of which are the primary outlets I use to publish when new episodes come out. Uh, So I will be back next week with more interviews with military veterans about their civilian career. Thanks.